You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Is your pet stressed out? Does your pet need annual vaccines? Which pet is best for a child? Would you know if your dog was in pain? Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor, where you'll learn everything about keeping your pet healthy and happy. From pet care, pet meds and grooming, to pet food, pet insurance and dental care, this is the place to find out everything there is to know about pet wellness. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets because it's your pet. Health matters. Please welcome your pet doctor host, veterinary media consultant and veterinarian, Dr. Bernadine Cruz. How do you know if your pet is experiencing a medical emergency and should be seen by a veterinarian? If you think it's an emergency, then it is one. Don't wait. Don't play amateur veterinarian and scour the internet for the answer. Don't call your best friend and see what they have to say. It's better to be cautious rather than have matters worsen. Problems caught early are typically easier to treat and have a better outcome and cost less to manage. My guest today knows all about emergencies. Dr. Heather Minio not only works at a referral animal hospital, one with a variety of specialists, but she's one of a handful of veterinarians in the United States who's a criticalist, board certified in veterinary emergency and critical care. We'll be right back after this short message. So sit, stay. We'll be right back. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. I'm not much of a reader, but I do wish I were more well-read. There are so many great books coming out. I wish I could find a way to keep up. Audible.com makes it easy to stay well-informed and catch up on your reading simply by listening. Audiobooks from Audible turn downtime into uptime. You'll be more productive and become well-read. Now I'm able to catch up on all the great books I've been wanting to read. With Audible, I feel smarter. Pet Life Radio listeners, try Audible.com now and get your first 30 days of Audible Listener Gold Membership plan free. And get a free audiobook. Choose from over 100,000 titles. To get this great deal, go to AudibleDeals.com. That's AudibleDeals.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to The Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio with Dr. Bernadine Cruz. The doctor is in and we'll see you now. Dr. Minio, thank you so much. I know because you are right down the street from my practice. I have sent you cases that are going, oh my goodness, I need help. So you are the one that helps me. Tell me, how did you get into critical care? That is a high stress type of a profession. It is a high stress stress job. That's right. I don't really have a a great step-by-step story for why I got into critical care. I think that I saw enough emergency cases as I was starting out as a veterinarian. And, um, you know, those first cases come in the door and you're just panicked and your adrenaline spikes and you you don't know what to do. But I've been doing this for a while now and I've grown more and more comfortable with it. And I think I find myself craving the adrenaline rush of not knowing what's going to come in the door. I, I appreciate the the less than mundane cases that walk in and, and never knowing what's going to come at me. So it's been a fun journey. It's something I still very uh, enjoy very much. And um you know, that's just, uh, I think, what my where my particular skill set lies. So you'd either be a shark cage diver or a criticalist veterinarian. <laughs> I like it. How does a veterinarian become a criticalist? What are the extra steps? So we all go through veterinary school. We're all exposed to, you know, the same type of curriculum. But then all of a sudden, Different people find areas that are of interest, so you found critical care. What did you have to do extra? When I went to vet school, we didn't specialize. Some of the vet schools, the students that are there do either a small animal track or a large animal track. I did everything, and I found myself paying close attention to details that other people maybe didn't. So that led me to pursue uh, an internship. I did a small uh, an internship for about a year at uh, VCA Manhattan Veterinary Group in New York City, that encompassed small animal internal medicine and surgery. And I, for the first time, you know, had to be a veterinarian on my own in the middle of the night. You're there 
by yourself with your nurses and um, the pressure's on you. And I happened to do quite well in that. So I decided to pursue a residency, uh, which is an additional three years worth of training. And I did my residency in critical care and emergency medicine at a small private uh, practice here in Southern California. So three years of that. And then I had to take a three-day examination to... uh, to prove my knowledge and my worth uh, so that I could become a member of the College of uh, Veterinary Emergency and Critical Care. And that was definitely high stress. There are very few of you, and thankfully, anybody, a veterinarian in particular, and our clients, I know, so appreciate it because there are times you need somebody who can think into that high pressure and have so many problems going on. You know, we've all watched television and seen the ERs and human hospitals. I know the same thing happens there at your facility at VMSG. So yes, veterinary medical specialty hospital, so group. So it is wonderful. What's some of the hardest part about your job? Uh, Well, the hardest part is having to explain to clients the unexpected. They come in knowing that their animals are sick, but maybe not understanding exactly how sick they are. So it's tough to meet somebody for the first time. You know, I don't have established client relationships in most of these cases. These are pet owners and pets that often I'm seeing for the very first time. And and I have to meet those people and explain to them that their animal is sometimes uh, experiencing a life-threatening illness or you know, worse, has passed away. And that's the hardest part. You know, it's no fun for any of us to lose patients. That's just not why we're here. But when you haven't made friends with these owners, you know, they come in and they're upset and and they're stressed out and they don't understand exactly what's going on. It was fine yesterday, Doc. And and, and now you're telling me it's dying. Right. And I mean, literally, sometimes it's, he was fine this morning when I left for work. What's wrong with him now, you know? And sometimes these animals hide their illnesses, but sometimes they truly come on that quickly. And I have to walk in the room and say, you know, try to explain things medically. And then I have to tell owners that their animals are maybe going to pass away or have passed away. And, and that's the part that I, that I dislike. I hate walking into a room and saying, hello, you're meeting me for the first time and your pet has a horrible illness and it's probably not going to survive. But it's the reality, unfortunately, of of being an emergency and critical care doctor. We see a lot of traumas and and really serious illnesses that come up at inopportune times, you know, Sunday mornings and Friday evenings when the family veterinarians are closed. And so so that's the hardest part. That's the part that I just, I hate to say hate, but I just, I I don't look forward to that at all. That's the hardest part for sure. I empathize with you because, yes, people come in. I've had that opportunity so many times to build that relationship over the life of the pet and got to know it from the time it was a kitten and now it's older and going, yeah, you know, we've been following this and we knew that Fluff was getting older and is having problems. But here you are, communications is so important. And oftentimes they just need to feel like I need to strike out and I'm mad at everybody. So, you know, take it out on you. And then there's finances that come involved with this too. And they want to do things, but then especially when it's a life and death situation, many times it's going to become expensive and it's like, oh, I should have gotten that pet insurance. So I always tell people, you never know when emergencies are going to happen. Pet insurance is such an important part of caring for your pet. You take pet insurance at your facility, don't you? Absolutely. Yeah. And I fully 100% agree with you that the best piece of advice I can give to anyone who has um, purchased or adopted a new pet is to get that pet insurance because, you know, a lot of those policies cover routine care, but almost all of them cover emergency care. And, um, and you know, when you walk in with your two kids on a Saturday morning because your daughter dropped the dog off the bunk bed and all Oops. of a sudden your dog's not walking well. You realize, oh, you know, now it's got a broken leg. How am I going to, do I pay my rent? Do I pay my mortgage? Or do I pay to have this bone fixed? And, you know, a lot of these problems are, are fixable, but money is a big problem. And that's that's probably the thing I hate second most after having owners lose their pets is having to explain to owners, you know, look, it's going to cost X number, hundreds or thousands of dollars to get it fixed, but we can get it fixed. And they say, you know, I just don't have it. And if you don't have pet insurance, you know, it makes these, these situations a lot harder. And it's hard on owners, you know, because they, they blame themselves. Accidents happen and, and uh, you know, sometimes animals eat things or, you know, they have problems that are fixable with appropriate medical care, but that care costs money. And if, if you don't have that emergency savings fund or you can't afford the credit card bill, you know, and you don't have pet insurance, then then we're really in trouble. 
a site that I love to have people go to, 1-800-PET-INSURANCE. It's an internet site, and it allows you to compare and contrast various policies and see the one that fits best for your needs. So yes, 1-800-PET-INSURANCE. They're not sponsoring this show, but I think it's a great site. Go to it, learn about it. So learning about things, you've had the opportunity to work on the East Coast as well as the West Coast. Do emergencies differ on one coast to the other or do you find they're about the same? No, I I think they absolutely differ. You know, on the East Coast, they have to deal with a lot more cold weather uh, than we have to deal with here. When I practiced in Manhattan, you know, virtually everyone lives in some sort of high-rise building. And so there's actually a a condition called high-rise syndrome, uh, typically cats that fall out of the windows in these high-rise apartment buildings. And they suffer a varying degree of injuries depending on which floor they fell from. There's probably more antifreeze ingestion and toxicity in the East Coast because of the colder weather. California, we have rattlesnakes. They don't have rattlesnakes in New York City, in case you were wondering. Um, (laughs) Maybe at the zoo. (laughs) Yes, maybe, maybe. But not a lot of rattlesnake bites in Manhattan. So we see those out here. And I think they're fairly uncommon in people, at least in the U.S., but in dogs and cats, but mostly dogs. We see them pretty commonly, and and, uh, as the weather in California starts to warm up, not that it ever cooled off this year, but, uh, (laughs) uh, you know, in the the spring, the snakes start to come out to eat, and the dogs are curious, and and they get bitten, and, um, you know, they can die if they're they're not treated with antivenom. So we call it snake season, and it's upon us now. We've seen our first couple of bites already, and we have to treat those. We also see a lot of um, heat stroke as as the weather warms up. We have dogs that like to exercise with their owners, and this being California, they exercise mainly outdoors, and that's great, except when it's hot or humid. And by hot, I mean, you know, 80 degrees will be enough Especially if you've got a, a flat-faced dog like a pug or a, a bulldog or a boxer, and you take those or dogs out running with you, or they're overweight. That's right, and they basically just work too hard in the heat. Dogs don't sweat like people; they only lose body heat. Well, they lose body heat primarily through panting, as you know. And um, the flat-faced dogs, they don't have great airways to begin with. Their noses are short, and uh, they don't get rid of heat as quickly. And they tend to breathe hotter, or harder, and, and that makes them hotter. And it spirals into a very, very serious, potentially fatal situation. So um, I always encourage owners, you know, remember that your dogs can't sweat. They lose heat by panting. So it's important that if they're going to get any kind of exercise, even if it's just moderate exercise, that they do so in the mornings and in the evenings when it's cooler. And it's not cute when you see those dogs with their tongues hanging out so long that they're hitting the ground. It means that there's a problem and they're trying desperately to get rid of the extra body heat that they've accumulated. And and, um, it's not a cute thing. That's something that's definitely an emergency. You need to get them in to see a vet. Too many times pets will arrive at my door going, oh my goodness, you know, we're out exercising, now it's collapsed, and you know, I just don't know what's wrong, doc. It's like, excuse me, you're on your bicycle, the dog is running behind you, well, why didn't it stop? It's like, well, it kind of expects you to be smarter than it is, so you need to be aware of your pet, stop when it's hot, or when they get burnt paws, like, well, I didn't know it was so hot, how did I know? I said, well, good way to do it is take your shoes off, Stand on the concrete or on the the asphalt, and if it's too hot for your feet, it's too hot for their feet. Yeah, absolutely. I can't tell you. I'm sure you've seen it too. You know, the dogs that come in and they literally run their pads off their feet, and they come in <sighs> bleeding and raw and extremely painful. And those, again, are expensive and time consuming, lengthy you know conditions that require lengthy treatment to take care of. So it's the outs of prevention. Don't don't run your dogs when it's hot outside. Just don't do it. It's it's, um, it's something that's easily avoidable and uh, it kills all of us, our staff, when we see an animal come in with something like heat stroke that was completely preventable. Um, uh. it's just It just really rips us apart. What are some of the common emergencies that sometimes people try to ignore? Once you say, oh, and afterwards they go in retrospect, I, if I'd only known. I would have brought this in so much sooner, Doc. I just thought it was X. What are you seeing? We see everything. We see, uh, you know, everything from trauma to poisonings to um, dogs that eat things that they, uh, objects that they shouldn't. I guess that's the, the one, one of the things there is when, when a dog eats something that it shouldn't, whether it's uh, your kid's sock or your underwear or a tennis ball or a rock, 
you know, veterinarians have medications that we can use to make those dogs vomit. And oftentimes when we do that, they'll bring up the offending object and sometimes they won't. And if they don't, places like my hospital, the MSG, we have an endoscope. And you can retrieve amazing things with those. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Back in the day, we used to have to take all of these guys to surgery to open them up and take out the rock. Well, now with the scope, it's the same thing sort of as a colonoscopy in a person. We use a long, flexible tube with a camera at the end of it. The animal goes under anesthesia and we can get dental floss and we can get Christmas ornaments and we can get balls and we can get rocks and bottle caps and underwear and hairballs and squeaky toys and all kinds of stuff. But we can't get them if you wait too long and the thing, the object passes out of the stomach because the scope is not nearly as long as your dog or cat's intestinal tract. So if I can get to it when the object's in the stomach, then for the most part, we're pretty safe. Um, Okay, Dr. Minio. Easy thing. What's the craziest thing you've pulled out of a dog's stomach? Craziest thing. Let's see. I had a case where the owners had had triplets, and they were running around trying to keep up with their babies. And their dog, over a course of months, swallowed 27 pacifiers. Huh. You found... (laughs) 27 pacifiers. They were all still in the stomach? All still in the stomach. (laughs) That was a good one. That's the one that sticks in my mind, but I've definitely, I've scoped pennies out of wild geese. I've done chicken surgery and removed nuts and bolts and chunks of glass and wire from a chicken's stomach. So it's been, um, you know, it's been a crazy ride now that I think back on it. <laughs> We're talking right now to Dr. Heather Minio. She is a board-certified veterinarian in emergency and critical care. She's at a fabulous hospital in Southern California Veterinary Medical Surgical Group. We're going to be right back after this short break. Please stay tuned. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. Dyson. The new Dyson Animal Backs are powerful bagless upright backings for homes with pets. Air muscle and radio root cyclone technology generates the strongest suction power to powerfully remove dust, dirt, and pet hair from the home or car. To order your Dyson Animal Back, go to DysonDeals.com. DysonDeals.com to order your Dyson Animal Back today. Dyson, music to your ears. Victoria Schaefer, aspiring actress, babysitter extraordinaire, college student, and animal enthusiast, is on her own for the first time in New York City. Follow Victoria and her two dogs, Rue and Echo, as she cares for her furry friends and juggles home life and career, all the while managing to survive in the world's most hectic city. The exciting animal adventures and secret stories from both ends of the leash that make up the tales of the city. Every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets on Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to the Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio with Dr. Bernadine Cruz. The doctor is in, and we'll see you now. Dr. Minio, I love your story about pulling out the 26 pacifiers. There, I'm sure you know of that competition they have amongst veterinarians yearly to send in radiographs, x-rays, of the most crazy things that an animal has swallowed. And one of the last ones, they always seem to be these large breed puppies. It was a toilet bowl brush, the entire long thing brush and the dog couldn't bend its neck and they were wondering what was wrong and they took this radiograph and it's like really what made you think that was a good idea so yes the dog did fine afterwards but it's like hmm it is amazing what are some of the other things that dogs eat because I know it's usually dogs eat first think later what are some of the most common ones that are toxic to pets cats and dogs you're right. Dogs definitely like to uh, to eat things that they shouldn't. Uh, cats less so, but they still do the same thing. Chocolate is probably the most common toxicity that we see at our practice, uh, especially uh, around this time of the year, the holidays and Easter, where there's 
chocolate that's accessible, the, the dog comes in and gobbles it all up. And not only do you not get any of the chocolate, but then you get stuck with a big veterinary bill. Um, and it's the really the good chocolate, chocolate, chocolate that causes problems, yeah, huh? It's that dark chocolate. It's a Godiva or whatever. Yeah, it's absolutely the fantastic, yes, dark, really rich chocolate that that is uh, most dangerous. And uh, it can cause symptoms anywhere from the hyperexcitability, vomiting, to uh, to seizures. And, and I, I've actually had a couple of chocolate toxicity dogs pass away on me. So mm. that's the most common one. And, and it's, again, something that's totally preventable. We also see uh, lilies around this time of the year. Lilies are, are fatal in cats. Um, and they don't have to eat much. They just have to sink their teeth into a leaf or a, or a petal and uh, those kitties can go into um, complete kidney failure and, and they don't have a good prognosis. I've heard it's uh, even some of the pollen that can get on things that can cause problems. Yeah. So it's not even just a small amount. Scary. Just a small amount. Just a, a couple of sprinkles for sure. Human medications are another big concern. People find their dogs kind of uh, maybe old and creaky, you know, and they're acting a little uncomfortable. So they'll, they'll give them a couple of Tylenol or a couple of Advil. And, and human medications are, are, in a lot of cases, really just meant for people. They're not metabolized normally or in the same way by dogs and cats. And so they can cause liver and kidney damage that can be severe in some cases. So that's always something when grandma comes over and she drops her blood pressure medication on the floor and the little dog runs over and picks it up, swallows it, that's that's a problem. So, so those are cases that we don't like to see, but that we see fairly often. How about um, medical marijuana? A lot of people yep. are now using it and think, oh, it's kind of fun to get my dog or cat high or, oh, it's kind of achy, creaky, let's give it some medical marijuana. What are the problems with that? Because I know there's been a lot of controversy. There actually are marijuana products that are marketed for dogs. You know, they call it sort of calming or eases the pain and this and that. And it's very misleading and and frankly very dangerous because dogs and cats do not metabolize THC well. And THC, as most people know, is the active ingredient in marijuana. And it's it's what gets you high. And um, in medical marijuana, it's you may not get high, but it's still an active ingredient. Those dogs and cats come in, and it's mostly dogs. And you can tell they look stoned, honestly. They, uh, they have big dilated pupils, and they are sort of floppy and non-responsive. And in some cases, they can have heart arrhythmias. They can have seizures. They can have low body temperatures. And so those are cases that we usually, uh, we don't induce vomiting in those, but we usually treat them with activated charcoal to, um, to bind to the THC that's still in their system and, and some fluids and, and hope that we're not going to end up with a ventilator patient because that patient's depressed enough that he or she stops breathing. So absolutely, there is no indication for marijuana use in dogs or cats, no matter what the label says. There have been times when I've worked emergency clinic or when I've had a client bring in a pet that I really think has gotten into some type of recreational medication, in particular drug. And you ask them, oh, no, no, didn't get into anything. It's like, and finally, after you try to build up a rapport with them, going, I don't care what it got into. I'm not calling the police. I just need to take care of your pet. Could it have gotten into some illicit drug? Oh, yeah, it got into my stash. So people should always be very upfront and let the emergency veterinarian, let their veterinarian know what a pet may have gotten into. It's the only thing to help the pet. That's right. I'm not going to call the police. I just want to help your animal. So the more honest you can be with me and the faster you can you can decide to be honest with me, the better the outcome. Whether it's, I mean, I've treated everything from marijuana dogs to cocaine dogs, crack cocaine, you know, methamphetamine. Just tell us what it is. I honestly could care less what you do in your spare time at home to yourself. I'm just here to help your pet. So, yeah, I, this honesty, you know, could save your animal's life. There's no question. The other thing I think that's so important, too, is to people to bring in the product, if at all possible, you know, using things like, oh, I put snail bait outside and there's different types of snail bait and how you treat it. Or even things like flea preventatives, the topicals. It says, you know, I just put a little bit on doc. Talk about flea products. I think that's really important, please. 
Absolutely, and and I, I agree. Whenever your pet comes to the hospital, bring whatever it's gotten into. Bring the box, bring the label, whether it's your medication or a poison of some kind, and bring the pet's medications. You know, sometimes they're going to be admitted to the hospital, they're going to need those medications. So always bring as much information with you as you can. We may send it back, but it really helps us to have it up front. The flea preventatives, that's another big one. You know, we'll find owners who purchase mostly the topical flea products, the liquids that you put on on their back and between their shoulder blades. And they'll take that liquid and they'll put it on their dog. And then they'll put just a couple of drops or a smaller amount on their cat because their cat might have fleas and they don't want them to have fleas. And the big issue there is that dog flea products contain chemicals in them that are fine for dogs and work on dogs, but are actually toxic to cats. So we just had another case this week of a kitty who was treated with the dog's uh, flea liquid, and they didn't know what was wrong with this kitty. And this kitty came in just shaking like a leaf, ended up having some seizures, was in the hospital for a couple of days, and thankfully made a good recovery. But we see them come in seizuring with low blood sugar and that sort of thing just because the owners haven't read the label carefully. And virtually all of these products state very clearly for use in dogs only, do not use in cats. So owners need to pay attention. Cats and dogs are different. They're not the same. And what might be safe for one may not be safe for the other. So very important, especially with flea medications, to make sure that you're using a cat product for a cat and a dog product for a dog. So many people think, and veterinarians, I think, for a long time too as well, cats are little dogs and dogs are little people. So we can kind of extrapolate one from the other of medications or or treatments. And as you said, they really are not the same beast. They're not just little dogs. What are some other things that cats do that can compromise their health? Oh, cats. Cats are, (laughs) I know you're a big cat fan. As an emergency veterinarian, cats are, they're just a mystery sometimes, you know, they, they have instincts for survival. And so kitties will hide their illnesses for as long as they possibly can until they're too sick to be able to hide it anymore. So they could be in horrible kidney failure and be eating and walking around the house on Monday, but on Tuesday, it's just too much for them and they're flat. And again, it's a situation where the owner comes in and he says, you know, my cat was fine yesterday. I don't understand. You know, what do you mean it's this bad? And, you know, you have to explain, look, kitties will hide everything for you until they just are so sick they can't do it anymore. Dogs sometimes do that as well, especially with pain. But cats, they don't read the books. They were taught as veterinarians uh, that there's, there are certain sort of expectations as far as how a sick pet behaves and how to figure out what the illness is based on the symptoms. Cats didn't go to veterinary school. <laughs> they write their own rules. They do it all by themselves. So their instincts are to act healthy as part of a method of survival because in the wild, sick and, and weak animals become food for other animals. So cats will, will not act like there's anything wrong until it's very bad. And that makes my job harder, but um, that's the way it goes. Uh, and speaking of hard things, sometimes it's hard for people to realize that what might be fun for a dog can also be dangerous. I know you have Parker and Bocce two little dogs, and you spend time on the soccer field with the kids, etc. And people love to take their dogs places where they can get out and run. And there are now dog parks throughout the United States. And there's pros and cons. What are your feelings about dog parks, especially being an emergency veterinarian? Well, I think dog parks are a great concept. You know, I've taken my dogs to the dog park and to Dog Beach here in California, and it's great when they just romp and play and tumble and chase with the other dogs, and they come home exhausted, and they sleep for, you know, 12 hours, and and that's (laughs) fantastic. It's great energy. It's great socialization. You're outside. it's, It's great. But... It's not always picture perfect. Uh, When you put a pack of dogs together, they revert to their pack mentality and they will fight and compete with each other to establish dominance. They'll compete for the toys. You know, you you bring that tennis ball and you're throwing it for your dog and some other dog says, hey, I want to play too. And they they will fight over over the ball or over another dog or they come into conflict. And and that's when the dog parks and dog beaches are scary because dog fights happen there. And um, as a dog owner, you have to understand that 
and accept that risk when you go. You can't get angry because another dog attacked and bit your dog. That's part of understanding the risks when you put your dog in that situation. That's part of why they separate big dogs and little dogs, obviously, but even little dogs can fight and bite each other and big dogs obviously can do the same thing. It's sort of like, for me, would you, if you go to a concert and you decide to stand in the mosh pit, are you going to be upset because somebody steps on you or you get hurt? You can't do that. It's, it's the same mentality. You can't put a dog out with 20 other dogs and then be angry when something bad happens. It's not fair. It's not, it's not a realistic thing. And so they see are dogs. Yes. Come in. Yes, they are. They're unpredictable. They mm. may be great with your baby and they may be great with your grandma and your other dog and your cat and your chinchilla, but you put them in a pack with other dogs and that's how they behave. Injuries definitely can happen. All right. So speaking of injuries, as we wrap this up, you being a criticalist, a um, board certified veterinary emergency and critical care veterinarian, what probably give us three tips that you really wish pet owners would do think about in, in a pet emergency? Uh, three tips. The first thing I would say is, you know, if you're worried that something is wrong with your pet, then call a veterinarian. In most cases, you'll at least get to talk to a veterinary nurse and they can tell you, oh, this doesn't sound good or, oh, yeah, that might be a normal behavior. And they can give you some recommendations about whether or not your pet should be seen by a veterinarian. At some hospitals, uh, including my own, you oftentimes will be able to speak to a doctor over the phone. And I can't make a diagnosis while your dog's at home and I'm on the phone with you. But I can ask more sort of pointed questions, get to the bottom of things and tell you whether or not your pet needs to be seen. I can't give you medical advice. I can't prescribe medications over the phone if I've never met your pet. But calling a veterinarian is probably the smartest thing you can do. Don't jump on the internet and play Dr. Google and try and be an internet veterinarian because there's a lot of information out there. And although, you know, some of it is very accurate, there's a great deal of it that's not. And um, better to go straight to the source and a phone call is always free. So that's the first thing. What else? Two other, don't wait too long. If you see your, your cat jumping in and out of the litter box and straining, but actually not urinating, don't wait two days until your cat is flat on the floor and not moving. Don't wait until your dog hasn't eaten for three or four days before you think, oh, maybe I'll make an appointment for a week from today. You know, time is of the essence. And the longer you wait, the sicker your animal might get and the the worse the outcome might be and the higher the bill is going to be. It's a lot easier for me to scope a rock out of a stomach on day one than it is for you to have to pay for your dog to have surgery uh, and be in the hospital for three days because you didn't do anything about it on, on day one. So that's the second tip. Third tip, try to stay calm. You know, oftentimes you're going to bring your your animal in. It's been hit by a car or attacked by another dog or something like that. And our nurses are going to rush right out to you and they're going to see what's going on with your pet and they're going to ask you a few questions and they're going to bring your pet to the back into the back of the hospital in the treatment area so that I can examine your pet while you're taking care of paperwork and getting your pet registered. I'm going to do an examination. We're going to manage any pain that we need to. And within a few minutes, we're going to give you an update as to what's happening. But don't insist on coming back to the treatment area with your pet. It's just not, it's not helpful to anyone. It's not practical. And it really can be very emotionally stressful to your animal to um, have you be there and be very, very upset while we're trying to assess him medically. So be patient, you know, with us. We're there to help. We're not going to rack up a huge bill right when you walk in the door. But we are going to assess your pet, do what needs to be done, and if there are any immediate life-saving measures, and we're going to, and then we'll update you as quickly as we can. So, so just keep that in mind that we're there to help. Dr. Heather Minio, this has just been some great information. Hopefully, people will realize: yes, be patient. Veterinarians are there to help. Don't wait too long. Get pet insurance, and if there's a question, call your veterinarian. So, so important. Thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. Minnie. I really do appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I had a good time. Thanks, Dr. Good. Well, thank you very much for listening. This is Dr. Bernadine Cruz on The Pet Doctor. Please tune in again next week. We'll have more information on how to make you the best possible pet owner. Thanks for listening. Have a great week. Pets can be a wonderful addition to your life because they're a member of the family. Keeping them healthy and happy is important. Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor with veterinary media consultant and veterinarian, Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets. 
The Pet Doctor, on demand every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com.